Stanford University.
Please be seated. Welcome to the 2009 Stanford University Baccalaureate. I'm Scotty McLennan, the Dean for Religious Life. The Baccalaureate has a long history in American universities. The same word that refers to the college degree also means a religious service for graduating students, according to Webster's Dictionary. Here in Stanford at recent years, in recent years, the baccalaureate has been a multi-faith experience, celebrating the magnificent pluralism that this university has come to embody. Our speakers today come from Jewish and Muslim traditions. We began with a Buddhist call to prayer, and you'll hear readings from Christian, Sufi, and Jewish perspectives. Talisman will sing spiritual songs in Zulu as well as in English. Taiko's drumming blessing has Japanese roots. The Menlo Brass Quintet's music is from the Western European canon. This should feel like a festival of and for the world. The theme for this year's service is social justice taking what's been learned here at Stanford out into the world, helping to transform it for the better. We're honored to have Ruth Messenger, the president of American Jewish World Service, delivering the baccalaureate address. Among many other activities, she has been tireless in working to end the genocide in Darfur. Our student speaker is Sohail Razak, who has been the president of the Islamic Society at Stanford. He's been deeply involved in efforts to alleviate poverty worldwide. As you leave Stanford as graduates tomorrow, may each of you carry forward the object and purpose of this university as described in its founding grant to qualify its students for direct usefulness in life to promote the general welfare by exercising an influence on behalf of humanity and civilization. Congratulations to each of you who will graduate tomorrow. Congratulations to your family members and friends. You should also note that there are five former Stanford students who are no longer with us as you graduate, listed at the bottom of your program notes. They either entered with the undergraduate class of 2009, but died before reaching this day, or were advanced degree candidates who died during the last year. The flowers on the dais here are in their memory. Life is so precious and in many ways so fragile. In the midst of this celebration today, we do well to honor Morris, Viet, Chaguna, Christopher, and Micah, and to give thanks for their unique contributions to the world during their short but full lives. Please join me in a moment of silence now so that we can reflect on their time with us and on their passing. Amen. Be a gardener, dig and ditch, toil and sweat, and turn the earth upside down, and seek the deepness and water the plants in time. Continue this work and make sweet floods to run and noble and abundant fruits to spring. Take this food and drink and carry it to God as your true worship. The Living Words by Rabbi Marshall T. Meyer. I believe that we all have the capacity to search out sparks of sanctity in our mundane lives. Judaism teaches that one of the primary goals is lehavdil bain kodesh leho, to distinguish between the holy and the profane. But it also teaches that nothing is forever doomed to the world of the profane. As Jews, we must seek to sanctify the profane 
taking seemingly banal and insipid actions of daily life and investing them with something of the transcendent. If it is true that as we approach the postmodern world, there is nothing cheaper than human life, then our task is to celebrate life, every life. We cannot continue to talk about sanctity and holiness in Judaism unless we are willing to commit ourselves to seeking out some of that holiness and sanctity in our daily lives. Thank you. There is a brokenness by Roshani. There is a brokenness out of which come the unbroken, a shatteredness out of which blooms the unshatterable. There is a sorrow beyond all grief which leads to joy and a fragility out of whose depths emerges strength. There's a hollow space, too vast for words, through which we pass with each loss out of whose darkness we're sanctioned into being. There's a cry deeper than all sound whose serrated edges cut the heart as we break open to the place inside which is unbreakable and whole while learning to sing. Sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes.
Good morning. President Hennessy, Dean McLennan, Rabbi Carlin Newman, Sohail Rozak, distinguished dais guests, graduates, and family. I want to begin by extending my most heartfelt gratitude to the Stanford faculty and administration, and especially to the Office for Religious Life, which have given me the honor and opportunity to speak with you today. This is a triumphant moment for the graduates and for your families, and I am truly humbled to be part of it. A word first in the back rows to all the family, parents, grandparents, friends who helped the graduates reach this day. Let me confer on each of you the degree of PST, which stands for putting someone through. And let me remind you, as your hearts swell with pride, these young people are now adults. To be sure, they are adults without the benefit of your years of experience. But that is the thing about experience. No one can have it or create it for anyone else. Your experiences are not the ones waiting for them. They must create their own. We must give them the right to make choices and to make mistakes. In fact, the best present you could give your graduate this weekend would be to tell her or him one of the biggest mistakes you made and, hopefully, how you found your way out. I do not advise you to do this so that they will avoid that specific mistake although perhaps they will. I advise you to do it because they need to understand that that is the way to who they will become by making their own choices and their own mistakes. And now to the graduates. Make those choices for yourself and for your own futures. Have faith in your capacity to create your own experiences, to learn from your own mistakes, to build your own life and give it as much meaning as you can. Strike to make a mark on the society in which you live. Take risks. Be bold, courageous, and strong. Remember, you are what you do, not what you think, or what you want, or what you dream. You are what you do. You are the people who will shape the next century of our country and our world. And unfortunately, that world is broken. A world of extreme poverty and obscene wealth. A world in which, as astonishing as this sounds, the 500 richest people earn more than the 416 million poorest. This is a world which offends our commitment to fairness and insults our belief in justice. And these inequities are, of course, further challenged by the current global recession. It will be harder for some of you to find jobs than it should be. There are people we know, some of them undoubtedly here today, who have suffered the loss of jobs or health coverage or retirement savings. We must try to help them maintain their dignity and self-worth for they still have much to contribute. There are others we may know whose investment portfolios have shrunk. They might think that their lives have been substantially altered, and in some ways they are right. But for many of the world's poorest, shrinkage of their portfolio means going from one meal a day to none. When we have less money than we used to have, it hurts. It may limit our options and it can damage our sense of self. But we must remember that money is not everything. It is a tool. Our values and our integrity are the true essence of who we are as individuals and as a society. And we cannot let them diminish because our financial resources have shrunk. We will be judged ultimately, each of you and each of us, more by our values than by our monetary value. And there is no more value, value more important, as Dean McLennan said, than working to improve the way things are. I hope that as you shape your lives and build your futures, you will make the choice to act for justice. 
engage the problems that threaten the future of our nation and the world, and embrace a responsibility to those people in need, both in the global south and in our own country. They need your commitment. Rabbi Marshall Meyer, whose piece Jordan read earlier, wrote, we must search out the sparks of sanctity in our mundane lives. While most of us may never be recognized as heroes, there is a kind of heroism in finding these sparks of holiness in taking what may feel like mundane actions in our daily lives and investing them with something transcendent. Regardless of what you do next or at any future point in your lives, you can find ways to engage this heroic and holy effort to solve humanity's biggest problems. You can be part of this sacred search for justice. Of course, you can make it your life's work, and I personally hope some of you will do that. But you can also engage with it at graduate school, at any job site, as a constant and committed voter, and as an individual seeking that higher sense of self. When I was growing up, my mother worked at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and I had the opportunity to spend time with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a faculty member regarded then and now as one of modern Judaism's most influential thinkers. Once, when a reporter pulled him aside during a civil rights march with Dr. King in the South and asked why he wasn't home praying, he said, I am. I'm praying with my feet. I'm praying with my feet. By pursuing social justice, Heschel believed, we can encounter the divine. We can understand in the deepest recesses of our souls what it means to be alive, why we were put on this earth, what is our value to humanity. We may not ever be able to understand why society permits inequality, intolerance, hunger, disease, or genocide, but we can understand what we can do to stop them. We can, I would argue, that we must do this work now in the 21st century, and that each of you can be part of this effort. Stanford University, of course, gave you some of the tools, but others you have had all along. It is really very much a question of how you use the resources you have. Of money, yes, but more importantly, of values, commitment, energy, time, leadership, and organizing skill to make a difference. There are, as you all know, national and global problems of climate change and of health care, of shelter and of sanitation. But the worst consequences of growing inequity are seen today in the eyes of the children, those dying of hunger in Africa, those neglected in our own communities the children here or there who are unable to get health care or quality education, the children whose futures are being unfairly curtailed as we sit here on this beautiful campus this morning. In our own country, still by far, of course, the richest country in the world, where nevertheless 12 million children fell below the poverty line last year, the assumption is that 17 million will have fallen below that line this year, their families coping with unemployment, rising food costs, and the disappearance of affordable housing. Globally, children of every race and nationality have the same problems, but they are of an almost unimaginably larger magnitude. There are 27,000 children a day, yes, 27,000 children a day who lose their lives to an abject poverty which is both a cause and an effect of hunger and disease. There is no easy way to say that and no easy way to hear it. But I pray this morning that you do hear it and that you do not retreat to the convenience of being overwhelmed. Let me repeat that. We cannot retreat to the convenience of being overwhelmed. There is work for us to do and these children need our commitment if we are not to lose more of them to inequity and injustice. 
For the first time in history, the world has the knowledge, the resources, and the capacity to move all people out of poverty, to affect change in every corner of the globe. The question is whether we will all take part in this effort. We can act individually. Each of you think for a minute of what contact you have had with other countries and their citizens since you woke this morning. Some of the graduates come to this campus from other countries. But I would ask each of the rest of you who may not have talked to those students, did you drink coffee or cocoa whose beans were picked in the developing world? Do you know where every article of your clothing was made? We can respond, paying attention to what we eat, where we buy our coffee and our clothes, whose employment benefits we protect, how we limit our impact on the environment, what we do with our time and our money to strengthen these connections for good. And we can act collectively at the government level to ensure that the world's industrialized nations invest in creating greater equity. They can provide full forgiveness on debt owed by developing countries. They can dismantle trade agreements that allow their countries and multinational corporations to become wealthier at the expense of the world's poor. And for the price of two months of war in Iraq each year, we could put all children in school, eliminate avoidable, avoidable infant death, wipe out malaria, and cut global poverty in half by 2015. Significant progress has been made, but there is much more to do. And in some ways, and in some places, the situation now is getting worse. We have a long journey ahead. What is required first is that we embrace our responsibility to humanity, commit to help those with whom we do not share a faith or a neighborhood, a country, a language, a religion, or a political structure. We must bend our minds and our voices, our energies and our material resources to helping those most in need, both at home and abroad. What is required next is that we keep these intentions front and center in our own lives. If you pursue wealth, and please feel free to do so, that pursuit should not define you. Whether you are raising children, creating art, healing bodies, passing laws, making money, or seeing the world, you will, each and every one of you, have opportunities over and over again to speak up for diversity, to vote for equity, to demand inclusion, to stand for justice. Rabbi Heschel, whom I mentioned before, wrote, the eternal has not created the universe so that we might have opportunities to satisfy greed, envy, and ambition. We have not survived so that we might waste our years in vulgar vanities. God is waiting for us to redeem the world. And when asked in one of his final interviews what advice he had for young people, he said, let them be sure that every deed counts, that every word has power, and that we can all do our share to redeem the world in spite of all absurdities and all frustrations and all disappointments. And above all, let them remember to build a life as if it were a work of art. Graduates, as you build your lives, as you create the people you will be, keep your eye on the pursuit of justice. Own the problems you see, accept responsibility, and commit to work for change. It is important to be involved on a personal and a service level, to feed the hungry, to work directly with the poor, to make a difference in the world. But service alone is not enough. Be ready also to tackle the root causes of injustice, to demand new policies, and to embrace advocacy. Please do not do this work by yourselves. Step forward, get involved, and then exercise your power to mobilize, to organize, to convince others. Be inclusive, build a community of activists, and convey a sense of hope and possibility to those with whom you work. And undertake these efforts with a mixture of patience, of hope, and of fun. We need to understand the often complex, always too slow ways to get from here to there. It will not be easy, but I can promise you that the rewards will be great. And we need hope, that ingredient that keeps us going 
when we might otherwise quit. But don't forget the fun. The end doesn't justify the means. The means are the ends. If we want joy and friendship and laughter at the end of the struggle, then we must have them along the way. This is what I wish for all of you and for all of us. Hone your political will and your moral determination. Act with integrity. Allow time for learning and reflection, but do not shy away from action. Invest in building a better world for those children, wherever they live, who so desperately need our help. The child in a homeless shelter in San Francisco, or the child holding an empty bowl in the slums of Delhi, might one day cure Parkinson's disease or stop global warming. The creation of a just society, then, is all of our responsibility. It is how we express our devotion to God, how we can create greater harmony in this broken world. It requires that we understand ourselves as responsible for the other, learn that our actions have consequences for those around us and for those on the other side of the globe. We live our values, we honor God when we help those in need, work with them for greater justice in their lives, use the affluence and influence of our communities on behalf of everyone. As our texts teach us, the answers are not in heaven and not beyond the sea. As long as there is poverty, violence, and oppression any place, we are all from an underdeveloped world and we should be working to set it right. There's a famous Jewish commentary which observes that it is not our obligation to complete the task, but we cannot refuse to participate. A similar thought was articulated centuries later by Archbishop Oscar Romero, the cleric who worked to protect the peasants of El Salvador, one of the places that I work. Let me close with his words. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. This is what we are about. We plant seeds that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Congratulations and thank you. Bye. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. May God's peace, blessings, and mercy be upon you. Graduates of the class of 2009, as I stand before you today, I'm overcome with nostalgia, gratitude, and excitement. I'm reminiscent of my journey through Stanford's rich tradition of religious diversity. Over the past four years, I've experienced the soothing prayer of a Catholic rosary, the peaceful introspection of Buddhist meditation, and the delightful celebration of Holi, the Hindu festival of colors. I'm grateful to my Jewish friends for breaking bread with me on the Shabbat, and my Baha'i classmates for telling me about the inspirational life and works of Abdul Baha. My interaction with different faiths has allowed me to develop relationships of trust, respect, and mutual understanding. And at the same time, better understand my own faith, Islam. I've come to see the value of religious pluralism prescribed in the Holy Quran as God speaks to us. O oh, humankind, I have created you into diverse nations and tribes, so that you may come to know one another. Verily, the most honored amongst you in the sight of God is one who is most righteous. Before I move on, I believe it's important for me to acknowledge the people without whom this day would not have been possible for any of us. On behalf of the class of 2009, I'd like to thank our parents, our grandparents, our siblings, our teachers, our friends, our families, and our mentors. Thank you for your unconditional love and your countless sacrifices. 
Thank you for always, always being by our side in our moments of doubt and our moments of joy. Thank you for sometimes giving up your dreams only so that we could fulfill ours. We are who we are today only because of you. Words cannot possibly express how much I miss my parents today. But I'm grateful to my sister who is here with me. And I'm grateful to all of you, my friends in the class of 2009, for being my family over the past four years. While I'm extremely proud of my last four years at Stanford, I feel a huge sense of responsibility as I enter the world beyond our beautiful campus. A world plagued by poverty, hunger, disease, illiteracy, and injustice. However, I have reasons to be optimistic because members of the class of 2009 have given me hope through their actions and their words. You have shown me that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Thank you for giving me hope by telling me the stories of young role models who completely changed the world for the better. I was told the story of Martin Luther King Jr., who at the age of only 26, led the bus boycott in Montgomery and completely changed the course of history by eliminating racial inequality in the United States. I have faith that we have a Martin Luther King amongst us today, someone who will address the economic inequality that plagues our planet, someone who will devote her or his life to helping the forgotten billion people who live on less than $1 a day. I was told the story of Mohandas K. Gandhi, who at the age of only 24 planted the seeds for the movement against apartheid in South Africa. I firmly believe that we have a visionary like Gandhi amongst us today, someone who will launch a global movement to provide healthcare to the underprivileged, someone who will work towards preventing the deaths of four million children who lose their lives every year due to preventable, curable diseases. Class of 2009, if you still have doubts about your ability to change the world, let me share with you the story of the three stone masons. During the Middle Ages, a man approached three hardworking stone masons and asked them what they were doing. The first one grumbled, I'm cutting stone. The second one responded with a deep sigh, ah, I'm building a wall. The third one responded with a radiant smile on his face. I'm building a beautiful cathedral that will glorify God for centuries to come. Our lives may be limited, but our dreams don't have to be. Our resources may be finite, but our impact doesn't have to be. Class of 2009, I leave you with one very simple question. Do you have what it takes to be the change you wish to see in the world around you? Congratulations once again. Good luck on your journey ahead and Godspeed. I invite you to rise for the benediction. There is a divine dream which the prophets and the rabbis have cherished and which fills our prayers and permeates the acts of true piety. It is a dream of a world rid of evil by the grace of God as well as by the efforts of people who are dedicated to the task of establishing the oneness of God in the world. The eternal has not created the universe so that we might have opportunities to satisfy greed, envy, and ambition. 
We should not spend our lives hunting for trivial satisfactions while God is waiting for our efforts and devotion. We have not survived so that we might waste our years in vulgar vanities. God is waiting for us to redeem the world. So may we be the world's redeemers. Amen. Please be seated as we enjoy the drumming blessings of Tycho.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.